We are always delighted to partner with Hebrew College, and it's particularly exciting to be in conversation with these wonderful authors tonight. Um, and I uh, reiterate Marilyn's thank you for venturing forth. I have to say, I was like sitting there like, okay, we can do this. Uh, but there's nothing more warming than stories and conversations, so, plus tea, so it really couldn't be better. Um, so the Jewish Women's Archive, as you heard in our little uh, mission statement, documents Jewish women's stories, elevates their voices, and inspires them to be agents of change. Um, but what that really means is that we use history as a framework for exploring the issues and conversations that are important to Jews and to women today. We were founded about 20 years ago as an online archive in the early days of the internet to uncover and uh, preserve the many buried and forgotten stories of Jewish women who have shaped their families and their communities for as long as we have existed. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that the contemporary stories of Jewish women were known and documented as well. And in doing that, our work has really grown beyond the boundaries of scholarship and the kind of traditional understanding of what history is to include other platforms and media that help us explore the lives and experiences of Jewish women, including fiction and memoir. And in 2015, we founded a book club to bring together an online community of readers who love good books by and for Jewish women, since Jews and women are the biggest book buying populations. We kind of found our sweet spot there. Um, so I really urge you to check out our website at jwa.org, um, where you can see all of our archives and materials there and sign up for our book club. Um, and at our book club, you'll find book recommendations and author interviews and videos and information about public programs like this one. Um, I also urge you to check out our podcast, Can We Talk, which you can find on our website and also on iTunes. Um, and I'm just delighted to be able to include you in this conversation tonight. We really want this to be an intimate and um, communal conversation. So we will certainly talk among ourselves some, but we also will open up and have questions from the audience as well. So I am really honored to introduce our speakers tonight, um, who I'll introduce from far too near here. Um, Jennifer Brown is the author of the novel Modern Girls. She has published fiction and creative nonfiction in Fiction Southeast, The Best Women's Travel Writing, The Southeast Review, The Sierra Nevada Review, and Bellevue Literary Review, among other places. Jennifer has a BFA in film and television from NYU and an MFA in creative writing from the University of Washington. And she lives in the suburbs of Boston with her children and husband, and apparently she likes winter <laughs> and finds it conducive to writing, which I guess I can understand. Mm -hmm. um, Anna Solomon is the author of the critically acclaimed novel The Little Bride and most recently of Leaving Lucy Pear and a two-time winner of the Pushcart Prize. Her short fiction and essays have appeared in publications including the New York Times Magazine, One Story, Plowshares, and Slate. She's the co-editor with Eleanor Henderson of Labor Day, True Birth Stories by Today's Best Women Writers and she previously worked as a journalist for NPR. Uh, Anna was born and raised in Gloucester and lives now in Brooklyn with her husband and two children. And Tova Mervis is the author of three novels, Visible City, The Outside World, and uh, the national bestseller, The Ladies Auxiliary. Her essays have appeared in various anthologies and papers, including the New York Times, the Boston Globe Magazine, and Good Housekeeping. And her fiction has been broadcast on NPR. She has been a scholar in residence at the Hadassah Brandeis Institute at Brandeis and a visiting scholar at the Brandeis Women's Studies Research Center. And she lives right here in Newton with her three children. So I'm delighted to be able to be in conversation with all of you. Um, so we had a chance to have a conversation a little bit before uh, coming here tonight. And one of the themes that emerged as we were framing this evening's event and also just responding to the conversations that have been bubbling up in the last several weeks is thinking about this concept of identity and particularly about how we think about identity politics. Um, and we know in our work at the Jewish Women's Archive that you know even though our the name of our organization identifies Jews and women that we're always kind of approaching the stories that we tell and the work that we do from a lot of different kinds of angles, even in our small staff, that's the case. And so I wanted to begin by asking you all the question of how you approach your work with the various 
multiple identities that you hold and think about that. Anna, do you want to start us on? Sure. Um, <laughs> it's a too big question. I know. Um, I think that it's interesting. So I think that when I, I think, you know, my, I guess my, the way that I identify and maybe more to the point, my confusion about, around my identity has certainly fed into my work in ways that are most, you know, that I start to see as I sort of progress, but that, um, you know, in ways that were, that I was kind of blind to when I was especially starting to write fiction. So for instance, I mean, I grew up in Gloucester, as she mentioned, I grew up in a very, you know, there were very few Jews where I grew up, and it's a very, very small congregation. My family was very active in it, but my overall, the world that I was part of was very much like not a, not a Jewish world, and I had a lot of sort of sense of both belonging, being a native, but also very much being an outsider, and that was very much part of my, and also having a lot of wasp envy, um, you know, like getting on the, I was playing lacrosse, and like here was my hair and um, you know it's just like a lot of you know but I didn't I didn't know that I had all these issues but but when I started writing fiction when I look back at it like my first published short stories you know the for very first published short stories is like about this old man in Maine named Miss Walter Seed who's like a you know and it came out of work I had done as a journalist it wasn't like it was just out of the blue but there were I didn't start writing about Jews for like eight years it was like I, I just it was like well maybe that doesn't you know exist um, and then what was interesting, when I, my first novel set in South Dakota, it's about Jewish pioneers in the 1880s. And, you know, that I think was sort of this extreme, like, what is, what happens when Jews are in a place where Jews don't belong, you know? Um, so I guess I do think that it, um, I think that, I guess what I mean, I'm not in full control is I guess what I would say of how my, and I don't know that I'd want to be, because I think that's sort of um, the beauty of fiction in particular. You know, each book that I write, I sort of understand in retrospect how personally my identity may have created this or caused me to do that, but I try not to be too self-conscious of it as I'm writing, because then I think it would just stop what I'm doing. So um, anyway, I won't, I won't go on. There's more to say, but I'll leave it at that for now. So the writing sort of becomes like a, a way to get into the exploration as opposed to the place where you project it onto or something. Yeah, or, or I guess through the writing, or, or sort of I, I'm led by the writing places. I'm drawn to certain stories for very clear reasons that I only understand later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It says that's like a fiction, fiction is almost like a playground for all your buried issues or questions. <laughs> right. And, right. You know, I don't feel like I come into it saying, well, I'm going to explore what it meant for right. me to be an Orthodox Jew in Memphis, Tennessee. Yeah. It's just, right. I'm going to be me on the page. I'm going to bring right. myself, and even if when it's fiction, I'm going to bring my questions and my uncertainties and my you know, doubts and worries and desires, and they're going to all be there, and they're going to get spread out through different characters. But I feel right. like fiction may be you know, different than other kinds of writing. It's, I don't think you approach it saying, well, I'm going to explore Jewish identity here. It's right. sort of, and it's there. And, I think, and I remember an experience with my first novel where it changed very much. It was about the Orthodox Jews, Jewish community where I had grown up and where I was so steeped. And I knew that was going to be my setting, but I had a very different plot in mind. And I finished the book, and I at first had this feeling of, wait, this wasn't the book I meant to write. <laughs> and then I you know, looked back over it again, and it was almost excruciating to realize, oh, of course, this was the book I had to write. <laughs> it was like me right. splayed all over the page. You know, <laughs> it's right. that, yeah. I sense that it, it, yes. it comes at you That's in that direction almost. That's in a great way. Of way. <laughs> and for me, it was almost like writing is a place where I could not only live out my own fantasies, but I had a, some, a, a sort of very different experience in that um, we moved around a little bit, but I spent most of my years in South Florida, which is very Jewish. Um, you know, I grew up in, in from through fifth grade, I was in South Miami, and I had a very secular parents. Um, you know, my mom would do some sort of token things, but my father, had been, after his bar mitzvah, he was done. He was like, that's it. Um, and so all everything I got was through my grandparents. They would take me places, do things. And then from fifth to ninth grade, we lived in Boulder, Colorado. And there I was the only Jew. So I went from being the Jew who did nothing to all of a sudden being this Jew who was like the Jew, right? Because there were no <laughs> other, there's like, I think there was one other in the entire junior high. Um, and then we moved back to Miami Beach, this is where I went to high school. And once again, okay, now I'm the, you know, the lapsed Jew, the Jew who doesn't know anything at all. So I created a world where it wasn't even a question, right? Like everybody belonged in their Jewish world. And, 
they sort of grappled with how to make their identities work within that. Um, but it was really nice for me not to have people sort of question, like, well, are you really Jewish? You're not really Jewish enough. Um, you know, and because that was something that was always just a big thing for me. I think it is interesting how there's these kind of overlapping arenas of outsiderness. You know, like even for, you know, in the Ladies Auxiliary, for example, you have the these Orthodox Jews in Memphis, so they're outsiders in their kind of larger sphere, but then they are very protective of their the insiderness of their own community when you know other Jews come into it. And you know, I think there's, I hear what you're saying, Jennifer, about the you writing about this immigrant milieu where you know there it's very much steeped in Jewishness, but then of course they're encountering non-Jews at work and other places where in fact the line of being Jewish or being accepted mm -hmm. is very stark and I think similar also in both of your books Anna there's there because they take place in different you know in previous periods where Jews were very much others in the places where you're writing um, and then of course when you have female characters who go into that too they have their own certain otherness um, so and then some people would say maybe that the role of the writer is an, is a kind of outsider observer yeah um, so you kind of inhabit that piece okay. as well. I feel like outsiderness for me is a huge theme. I, my first book was very much, you know, as you said, about what it means to be outside of a community. And you know, I'm interested. I think it's sort of a central fiction theme. You know, I remember when someone told me, oh, you know, there's two plots, and one of them is a stranger comes to town. Right. And I was like, oh, great, that's my first book. You know, in a nutshell. <laughs> but that sense that you know, what does it mean to be outside of a group and to either be able to belong or not be able to belong, and that that push and pull between like self and community or individuality in the group and. You know, I feel like it's a theme of, you know, if I had to name one theme that follows me, I think it is that. Because even, you know, it's easy to construct that in a community where you can look at, I'm outside of this group. But I, I'm interested also in how people feel it, experience it, even if you can't point to a community where you, that you're outside of. I think we experience that inside of ourselves, where we can feel outside of others, even when we belong, or outside, like an outsider in a family, or sometimes even that sense of estrangement from our own selves. And that... That theme, I think, you know, comes back. I think that we are all outsiders in different times, or simultaneously with feeling inside and connected. And so, I feel like for fiction or memoir, it's such a rich theme. That sense of what does it mean to be, to want to connect or be unable to, to, to find that sense of connection and the, the loneliness or the maybe the self sufficiency, also independence, and being unable to to create that sense of connection. And I think for, for me, you know, my character Dottie, I mean, she grows up in this in this immigrant household, right? So she doesn't actually ever question who she is in those terms. But then when she goes to the office, um, you know, as the only Jewish person in the office, she experiences definitely anti-Semitism. And, you know, I, I relied a lot on family stories about this. This was not made up stuff. And then even dealing within her Jewishness, when she becomes involved with a man who is Jewish, but very secular, you know, you have to sort of figure out where you are. So from that side, you're, you are an insider then experiencing yourself as an outsider and, and sort of trying to figure out where you stand in all of that. So it's interesting exactly. um, that, yeah, it's definitely a, a running theme. Mm -hmm. I also think about the way in which when we move, you know, we move through the world, like you're saying, whether we, even in groups where we are sort of the insider, one of the things that fiction allows you to do, I think so beautifully, is to allow the reader to see the difference between what a person projects and what they experience, mm -hmm. right? So, like, and like one of my characters, Josiah Story, who's obviously not a Jew, um, or at least it's obvious to me based on his name, <laughs> but, um, is that is you know he's this he's but his his thing like he grew up as the son of a blacksmith and then he was sort of seduced by this by a very wealthy woman whose father runs the granite quarry and he's become the manager of the quarry and now he's running for mayor and. He's sort of been been kind of brought up into the, playing this role where he's constantly feeling like he's acting, um, and his confusion over sort of like, in, but allowing I mean what you know a, being able as a writer to to both to explore sort of how other people see him versus how he sees himself and um, sort of the confidence that he projects versus his like this anxiety that he has inside I think is one of my greatest pleasures in writing. Um, I feel like yeah. it's like the, the, the gloriousness of fiction and you yeah. get to go inside. And I, you know, I, Invisible City, I was really interested in that gap between how people sort of appear to us from the outside and what they experience themselves as. And I, I feel like 
maybe more so now than ever, there's that hunger for that sense of what are people really thinking. We all have our sort of Facebook public facade, my life is perfect, how's yours, sort of like <laughs> game face. You, could, you know, it's almost like a weapon we can use at people. But fiction is mm -hmm. that place where you go inside and you that there's that gap between how we present ourselves mm -hmm. and how, how we actually are. And I think that there's this hunger to see it for realness, to see what people are actually thinking and feeling. And that, you know, I think is what reading, you know, gives oh, that yeah, feeling yeah. of like, yeah. you know, the urge to, like, do we get to enter our friends in the same way? Do we get to know, like, what is really going on here? What is the truth? You know, you get little hints, someone's face doesn't look quite right, someone looks upset, but no one will say. And in you know, fiction, you say, and you finally get that sense right. of like, what, is, what is real and true and honest. Yeah, and you do, I mean, I think it comes back to what you were talking about before about loneliness. I think, you know, for those of us who love to read, which comes before we write, um, I know from, you know, it's sort of like recognizing, oh, these are things that I've never talked about that I feel and think, but look, somebody else feels and thinks this, right? Like like that recognition of, of what feels taboo or what feels bad or what feels like, oh, that's not nice, you know? And then you're like, oh, that, that's I, it's shared. Right. Um, so and that starts very young. I mean, I yes. I bet a lot of us started with Judy Bloom, and, and you know, I mean, but that was like the gateway book oh, in right. a sense that made it okay to write about those things that were taboo later on, and you right. just took it to a, a slightly larger level than you know periods and, and how big your bust was. Right. So my daughter and I just finished reading Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing, which was her first Judy Bloom was yeah. an hour ago. Oh. But we, I'm actually reading to my daughter who's been struggling with. Nightmares, and we were reading um, Wonder, um, which is like a children's book, and the, one of the, the child who has been a bully, there's a part where it goes into his perspective and describes how he has these nightmares, and she looked at me, and she was like, just like me, and I was like, mm -hmm. this is the moment, like, this right. is the, this is what reading is, like, you know, I'm like, Liana, you see in this character something that is you, and, you know, she was like, I can't believe I'm reading, I'm like, you have found the right book for you at this right moment. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, that's the pleasure, yeah. the thrill of it really, right there. And it still is. When you right. find that, when you're yeah. in that mood, it's like, oh my gosh, this is just what I need right, right now. Exactly. And that's also where it goes beyond, you know, good fiction goes beyond identity, too. Like, it's beyond right. sort of what group of people are, because then you realize that, or I, I, you know, I sort of do believe, although, you know, I write, I've written so far, my novels have been historical, but, and I do believe that, you know, certain, People at certain times, we all there. Of course, there's cultural consciousness, but I also do believe in like universal consciousness in the sense that we that we consciousness that we people feel and you know have the like same desires and fear like fundamentally, um, and I think you can see that in a way that really cuts across sort of this person is a Jew or this person is this or this person is that in fiction it allows you to really get to see the commonality. Yeah. I'm writing the first experience I had. Or this is person to bully. Right. Like, <laughs> but he also has nightmares. Right. Yeah. So. I remember when I was in high school, it was called the Yeshiva of the South in Memphis with 18 <laughs> girls in an all Orthodox high school. I somehow, I don't know how I happened upon this anthology called Catholic Girls. And <laughs> I devoured it. It was like different short stories or essays. And it was the first experience I had of, oh, this is my world. Like, this is me. I well, am these girls. And it was, you know, that same sense that you, you know, it doesn't, you know, that is not my identity, obviously, by any means. but. It doesn't matter what the label on it was. It was, you know, writing about rules and trying to be a good girl and trying to fit in. And it was that sense that you, we transcend those labels. We, we, the, the identity is, I feel the same way you do, or I know what that's like. Right. And I think it, right. it allows us, it, it opens other worlds to us where we can see people differently than when we do get closed off from like, you are not like me. You are not. You don't share the same label yeah. as me. It, it opens things up. I, one right. of the first book clubs I visited was a group of all Catholic women. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it was so cute that they tried to do a little Jewish spread of food. You're starting with the filter fish. That's a little. Yeah. 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 Maybe it's not more basic. That the immigrant experience is an immigrant experience, right? right? And it's like it could have been their Italian families as much as you know. And they all started telling stories about their own. I think there were a few Irish, few Italian, and uh, uh, it was really great that. You can have these universal experiences, and it, it really—I think—it makes you feel more connected to just people in general. Um, but I think there's also—I mean, I was thinking of an experience I recently had with my daughter, who's a voracious reader, um, and she, for the first time, was having one of those moments of just like crying when she finished a book because she felt that sense of loss of just like when she closed, she was like, "I just wanted to go on forever, and <laughs> I, I'm just—I'm scared to finish it." And so 
it was making me think about how there is this way in which reading kind of enters you into this world and combats a certain loneliness, but then the book ends and you're left on the outside of it. Yeah. Like you don't right. get to fully enter that, that world. Um, yeah. And so it, it's like another layer of that outsider piece. It's like you can be part of the world, but then you also, there's a barrier there in some way. Um, sorry, Rachel. Oh, no. um, I was thinking about this, I was thinking about my, as you were talking about my own, the kind of impact of reading on me. I'm trained as a historian, um, but I always say and maintain that I became a historian because I really, really loved to read as a kid, and I particularly fell in love with Laura Ingalls Wilder and was just like completely caught up in those stories. And I remember having a conversation not that long ago with someone who was like, I don't understand why you always say that that was your entry into history because that's not history, like. That's fiction, it's fictionalized autobiography, it's like, it's not real the way history is, it's not, you know, I was sort of like, I don't know what you're talking about. To me, you know, it's about that sort of like universal truth of certain kinds of experiences that you can see yourself in, and also the creation of a particular setting where it's so, you know, it's brought, it brings history to life. So it doesn't matter whether it's, you know, true or not, we can debate whether history itself even, where, where truth is lives in that. But um, but this sense of like creating a scene and creating a setting and making choices about how you depict a particular world, whether it's a world that is very firmly in the past or more in the recent past. Um, so I'd love to hear some of your thoughts about how you choose those settings and create those, those worlds. Um, uh, Jennifer, do you want to start with sort of thinking about that? Sure. The, the intergenerational immigrant, Amelia? I mean, for me, the question of, of when to put it, um, you know, the, the novel's based on um, the, the trigger of that little inspiration came from a family story about my own great-grandmother. Uh, but basically, the story is about unwanted pregnancy, and, you know, one of the characters is 19 years old and not married. And honestly, I sort of felt like if I had her had this happen today, it's sort of like a, a who cares, right? Like, you know, my my kid's school is filled with all arrangements of families and a single mother, my choice is not a big deal, but put it back into the 1930s and all of a sudden it really matters. Um, and the, it's, a, it's a much more loaded question. Um, and so I really, you know, it was really interesting for me to create this, this world that is absolutely fictional, but it had to still feel real historically. Um, and it was, um, you know, I, I mean, the, the research was, was Extensive, as I'm sure it was, uh, was for you as well. Um, although I'm sure nothing like your little bride. I was just amazed at that South Dakota. Oh. I was just <laughs> that just floored me. Um, but uh, you know, getting into the newspapers, getting into magazines. I took a tour of the Tenement Museum. You know, I, I tried to cook food like my characters would cook because I really wanted to. I wanted the reader to be able to experience it, and I felt like they couldn't experience it until I experienced it. Um, but at the same time, though, it's fiction, and you do have to make accommodations for the story. Uh, so I find that's actually a really interesting line, sort of like where you, where you stop the fiction and where you start the history and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, everything that I pulled in was, was through the time period. You know, there, every now and then I'd fudge something and say, well, that's where the fiction is, the historical fiction is. Mm -hmm. Right. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's so interesting because it's hard for me to remember. People ask, "Well, why did you, you know, why did you choose the 1920s for this book?" Um, and I think that for me, you know, it's hard to remember exactly the process of finding the story and finding the time. It was a very symbiotic process. And again, it's something that, in retrospect, I can say, "Oh, well, um, you know, I have a character that my book is also in part about an unwanted pregnancy, um, and this woman, and this young woman um, who." Uh, abandons her baby and this other, so this Jewish woman leaves her baby in a pear orchard and this Irish Catholic woman takes the baby and, and raises her and the book is about 10 years later, 19, set in 1927 on Cape Ann in Boston where they are brought back together and, along with the girl who's now 10 years old and her name of course is Lucy Pear. Um, but, you know, the, the 1920s allowed me to explore, I mean, te the, the prohibition and the temperance movement allows for me to explore so much around this character's repression after this experience of this unwanted baby of both her own desires 
and then everybody else is around her. Um, and it also allowed for, you know, the sort of then the, the underbelly of that, and my other, the, the Irish Catholic woman is making, trying to make Perry, and there are other people involved in, which is a pear wine, involved in bootlegging. Like, so there's a lot of, um, it allowed, I think it was both on a, like, thematic level, on a plot level, and then as I did more and more research, because I tend to let my story, it's interesting, the research question, I, in general, really let my story guide my research, and sort of, as I write, I figure out what I need to know. Um, and um, the, but the deeper I got into the politics of the 1920s and sort of what an extreme decade it was um, in terms of like the post World War One xenophobia and the like huge wave of like the anti-immigrant laws that were put into place during that decade, and then the Sacco and Vanzetti execution, which happens the summer of my book here in Boston, of course, um, that also started to kind of shift the way that I thought about the book. But it, I feel like there's a, always a kind of, um, again, it's like a symbiotic process between theme and plot and and the kind of cultural setting. Like I wanted it to, you want it to be, I think, more than like a, more than a backdrop. You know, like, oh, there are all of these people sort of, you know, flappers and like all of that. It all seemed exciting. At first, I think I was drawn to it for that. And then I was like, no, my goodness, there's so much more here. I don't know if that answers. But do you feel like certain historical pieces sort of suddenly appear there? Like I, so I was thinking about that in terms of Sacco and Vanzetti. Like, were you surprised to find them in the narrative, or were you sort of like, well, I'm writing about 1927, so Sacco and Vanzetti sort of need to be? No, there. I didn't feel that they needed to be there, and I, it took me a lot. I, I wanted them to only be there if they became. Um, more than backdrop to the story, um, they aren't like character. I don't, I don't fictionalize them. They're not. They don't enter the story, but they're that summer before their execution. It plays in in terms of the characters' lives, and there's a strike that happened. There were there were strikes all over, um, and there's a strike that happens at the granite quarry. When I when I understood that that strike, how that strike could happen, and then how it could affect the characters' relationships. Then I understood that I could include, you know, mm -hmm. include it. But for a while, I was thinking, well, maybe I should set it in 1926, or mm -hmm. you know, like I. So I really, I was, I had to figure out sort of how to make that, um, and whether it could be an integrated part of the story mm -hmm. rather than like splash this kind of piece of history in. Right, it's not coming from the history. To right, start I with really it. try not to. And I, when I teach historical fiction writing, you know, I, there are a lot of writers who've been like, for 10 years, been like just learning everything they can about a whole time period, but. Um, and then are really like, how do I find my story? And I do, like I said, I try to go the other way because I, it's both more efficient and also it feels like a sort of, um, it's just, I guess it's also fundamentally what I'm more interested in. Mm -hmm. I, I have to say though, I, did, I disagree a little bit in that I do a little bit more, I think, broader research because there's a lot of politics that goes in that doesn't actually go in. Sure. Right? Yeah, yeah. Like for instance, always a lot. you know, um, the, the Johnson Reed Act of 1924 takes place you know, 11 years before my book starts, but that was the um, the act that massively limited immigration to this country. Um, and because of that act, you know, my character's brother can't get in, and because of that act, um, the the kids go to this Jewish socialist camp up in Cold Spring uh, for young adults. And those were all created because of the immigration problems, which because meant that the labor unions didn't have enough people, which meant that the, you know, a lot of the Jews were assimilating, and so they created these camps. So. Even though it's not on the page, definitely, yeah. Um, yeah. There's there's a lot of politics in there. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel like place is sort of at the entry point for me. I feel like with my first book, with Ladies of Gallery, it was this one to evoke this world, this sort of this world that I felt like, on one hand, very deeply rooted in. My great 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 grandparents came to Memphis in 1870, and I grew up with this sense of being from Memphis. And you know, to be from Memphis, it wasn't just that I had been born there, but you know, my I needed a grandparent who was born there. And so, you know, my father, who was from Hampton, Virginia, is um, but has lived in Memphis for I guess almost forty five years now, is still is still described as, oh well he's not from Memphis. <laughs> but it explains something about him. And it does in a certain way though. He's not of the community, not from there. And I think um, so with ladies also I didn't want to trace that history. I wanted to sort of write about what's the result of that. What happens when people feel Deeply embedded in this place, when you know this community was described as the Jerusalem of the South, and I thought everyone thought of Memphis that way. I did not know <laughs> that Memphis. That was not a sort of a universal notion. Um, but I, I've always had this. I've always wanted to write about that sort of long-standing Southern Jewish history. And personally, when I first left Memphis to go to college in New York, people would always say, "Well, you know, 
I didn't know there were Jews in Memphis. And then, you know, why are there Jews in Memphis? <laughs> and, you know, I had this, this idea for, for this sort of several generation Southern Jewish novel that would really answer that question in some ways, but look at what it meant to be home or to feel that this place you are is the only place you could live. And I, after Ladies Auxiliary, I wrote a second book, The Outside World, that wasn't as much about place, and then moved to Boston um, from New York. And I moved here determined to write this several generation novel, and I wrote a few short stories based on it, and I had these like variants on it. It was called Potatoes for a variety of reasons, and I had like Potatoes 1, Potatoes 2, Potatoes 3, these <laughs> stories, and I started really trying to write this book and started doing for my research mostly, which at that point entailed interviewing my grandmother and just sort of trying to soak in that sense of family history. And I found that when, you know, being new to Newton and I guess to put it diplomatically, like hating it very, very much. Um, <laughs> you know, missing New York City, missing um, living on the Upper West Side. Um, that you know, I, I felt like I was. I feel like I write about places I'm longing for, and you know, this sense of you can imagine yourself to a different time period or a different place. And I think the only place I could imagine myself into was New York City. And so I wrote Visible City, thinking it was going to be a short project. I figured. Two years, you know, I don't know why in the world I thought that. What, what insanity made me think I could put a time limit on a novel like that? But I was like, oh, a short little book, and then I'll go back to this big southern novel. And Visible City ended up taking 10 years, you know, a decade later. Um, and it was really about this, that same sense of longing for place. And then I finished Visible City thinking, okay, it's time to go back to potatoes. I'm going to write this <laughs> southern Jewish novel. And then I wrote a memoir. So that, that potatoes is still waiting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's on the back burner, I always say. Um, so I was thinking about your, you know, in terms of thinking about like Memphis and New York as being both both those books as being very much rooted in place, but also very different in terms of like whether it's like a big open space that you're sort of lost in or a very right. kind of close space. Uh, and then I was also thinking about like in terms of writing about history versus writing about a place that you're from and that where people know you as you know the kind of like difference in risk in some ways I guess around like when you write about one of the I mean I always felt this way as a historian who wrote about um, like the second half of the 20th century my advisor was always like, it really just would be easier if you went a little further back and just wrote about dead people because then you don't have to deal with live people who like have ideas about and memories about what you're writing about. So <laughs> right. in some ways you sort of suffer that same thing. And then you went one step farther by writing right. wasn't bad memoir. Enough. Right. So um, so I guess my question is sort of about what that relationship is between fiction and nonfiction and kind of putting your, you know, kind of writing something that is very much real for you as well in terms of having to account for it in some way. Well, I thought that with Ladies Auxiliary, it was my first published anything. And I was 26, and I was at the Creative Writing Graduate Program at Columbia. And until that point, my biggest fear was, what were the 12 people in my writer's group going to say about it? And I would read parts of it to my mother. And she would say, oh, I love it. And oh, god, you're not going to publish this, are you? And <laughs> <laughs> I grew up you know, the, the central question that even to this day, I feel like it still sits on my shoulder, what will they think? Yeah. You know, this they, this all-powerful they, who certainly would have an opinion. And you, I think you internalize that voice. And it's certainly a voice that has dogged me my whole life. And, and I wanted to write about that. The latest auxiliary is narrated by this communal narrator. That It is that voice of we, of what we think and what we will say and what we believe you should be. And, you know, that internal voice I think many of us carry of who we're supposed to be. And, when I wrote it, the nice thing about a first novel is you can hope it will be published, but you have no idea. And so I wrote it with, when I would get nervous about it, I'd think, well, the odds of it actually being published are so small. You know, let me just get my Master's of Fine Arts, and I'll worry about it if it gets published. Um, it was published, and that year before it came out, it was my first experience in what is it like to make people angry? And you know, when there's a scene in Ladies Auxiliary where the a woman converts to, to Judaism and moves into this very tight knit community and she doesn't fit in. And one of the hardest scenes for me to write was a scene where Batsheva, my character, walks into Shul knowing that people are talking about her. And I was like, what does that feel like? I wonder. I, you know, it was so hard to imagine that. What did it feel like to be that person who people were talking about? Now I can write that scene very, very easily. And that I would say would be my forte scene. And so that that sense, could could you write your could you write something honest and truthful, knowing that people see things differently? 
that people come with different perspectives and have different ideas of what's not just what you should say publicly, what is airing the dirty laundry, what is not, but people experience things differently. There's, you know, people regard the exact same thing in different ways, and it's the complication of living with people and writing about people, whether they're real or imagined. And I think for me, with Ladies Auxiliary, it was a trial by fire. I mean, in Memphis, I am still, I will, whatever I do, whatever I write, I will always be known as the one who wrote that book. <laughs> and you know, that sense of was it nice and was it not nice, and there was a version with all the, the you know, so-called mean parts underlined, and was it good about this community or not good? And, and for me as a writer, it was realizing that if I wanted to be a writer, if I wanted to speak honestly, to find my own voice, and that struggle, I think it's, I think even when you've written several books, it's an ongoing, struggle to find that voice and to be willing to use it and to use it publicly. I think that there is constantly that honing that ability. I think it goes, you know, I, I, as I'm, you know, sitting with the, you know, edited version of my memoir in front of me, you know, that constant sense of, am I willing to say, knowing that people don't always like it and being able to live with that feeling. And so, you know, I'm saying this as much to myself, this is my internal pep talk to myself <laughs> on the brink of sending in the final version of a memoir, but that feeling of, I mean, it would be nice if you could only write about people when they were dead. Right. You'd have to wait a long time. <laughs> and again, you know what, maybe it's saying, you know what, there's a time when you claim your story, right? When you say, this is my truth, and this is how I view it. And I think writing has to be an experience of that. Or, you know, when I would, every day when I would sit down to write my memoir, I would come with this like anxiety of like, why have I done this? Why am I writing a memoir? I'm taking the most complicated part of my life. And, not just living it, but I will now tell everyone what we're doing. And there's that excruciating sense about it. But I would calm myself every day by my little mantra to myself was write honest, write true. And just something about that, that sense that when you write from not a place of anger or vengeance or mean spiritness, when you try to write from that place of honesty and true to, to convey something, I think that's when people connect to a story. And I, I Think that for all that is fraught about writing things, and certainly in our world of like trolling, don't read the comments, you know, world we live in, I think the ability to do that is, it's, you know, it's what makes me write every day. It's the only reason to do it, I feel like, to, to, to be able to, to speak honestly. So we had talked about people writing different reading different pieces, which we could do that now. <laughs> put my money where my mouth is. We, we could, or we could come back to you. I mean, I'll go for it. Okay. <laughs> So I am gonna so I am gonna read a little bit from my memoir, which um, I brought Visible City with me in case I chickened out, but <laughs> I'm not going to. Um, so this is the first time I've ever read from it publicly. Um, it is still in that um, it's coming out in September, and it's called The Book of Separation. And a version of it, um, the opening, the very very beginning of it, was published in the New York Times um, two years ago as a lives column. And you know I got these hundreds of emails in response. It was sort of this shocking, gratifying experience. And it was that, that it made me realize when you put your most private, vulnerable moment you know, in the New York Times, um, you get <laughs> people wanting to, to connect and share with you also. And it was people sharing all sorts of stories. And so I decided that I would, um, I would write a memoir. Um, and it's partially about leaving a marriage, but it's really about leaving Orthodox Judaism. Mm -hmm. It's about what happened, you know, what can you leave? Can you leave a world that it's not just that you're raised in, but it's so embedded and it's shaped really every part of you. So I'm going to read from the first, um, the first full chapter. And again, it is, it is the first time I'm reading this to anyone publicly. It is the Jewish New Year, the first since the divorce, and I've set out on my own. My three children are with their father at his parents' house, where I'd spent the past decade in these holidays. My parents, sister, and grandparents are at home in Memphis, well, they will observe this holiday in the Orthodox synagogue I attended for every week of my childhood. My friends are in their homes, setting tables, cooking for family gatherings. My brother, along with four of his eight children, is with throngs of fellow Breslover Hasidim, an ultra-Orthodox sect in the Ukraine, the site of their spiritual pilgrimage. And I am fleeing to Kripalu, a yoga and meditation <laughs> retreat in western Massachusetts. Until this year, we celebrated every Rosh Hashanah in the same way as the one that came before. To spend this holiday anywhere but in the long, solemn hours of Shul would have been unfathomable. But now, without the rules wrapped tightly around me, I no longer know what to do. Dreading the arrival of this year's high holy days, I have considered pretending they didn't exist, and decided to go to Kripalu only because yoga and meditation seemed to be the requisite way of moving on. 
I assume you're doing yoga, an acquaintance said upon hearing the news of my divorce. <laughs> I've told a few people where I'm going for the holiday because to do so would be to admit that I'm no longer orthodox, something I'm still unsure of myself. Kripalu was three hours from my house in the Boston suburb of Newton, a highway drive that until recently would have been impossible unless I'd studied the maps in search of easy back roads and plotted a route that felt sufficiently safe. For almost a decade of living in the Boston area, I've been gripped by a fear of driving, steadfastly avoiding rotaries, bridges, and tunnels, driving only the routes I had to, wishing I could still be in a driver's ed car, equipped with a passenger side brake, and someone who could stop me if I went too, pa too fast or too far. On the Mass Pike, the cars are passing me too many and too fast, and still shocked that I'm actually driving on the highway, I clutch the steering wheel, worried about getting into an accident. The biggest fear, though, is not of any injury I might sustain, but of the fact that then people will know I plan to spend Rosh Hashanah at some suspect retreat center, <laughs> instead of praying in Shul for a year of blessing, a year of goodness. At the start of all other years, I knew exactly what sort of goodness I was supposed to want, but on this new year, there was no ready prayer, even if I could bring myself to other one. Oh. It's very exciting to be the first, the first audience first in, one year. Oh. Okay. in a year. We'll have you back. In September. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, so thank you, Toa, for that, for sharing that, and for speaking beautifully, and for risking to share it. Um, so, you know, in terms of thinking about this question of of leaving community and putting oneself in new community and then also in terms of thinking about the, these questions of like the the narratives that are out there that we always have to grapple with and that are you know kind of about judgment and about the way people are reading us one of the other themes that we had talked about was around the Jewish mother and the stereotype of the Jewish mother as being one that is just still I have to say as someone who researches this like bizarrely present in a very unchanged form, despite how many other things have changed in <laughs> Jewish life and Jewish community. Um, we're also a panel of four women who all are Jewish mothers. So, you know, there's there's the way in which it is just kind of there as, you know, some kind of experience that may or may not be in any way related to the Jewish mother as a, as a thing. Um, but it is something that comes up, I think, in all of your books around both like the intergenerational pieces and around the role of women in assimilation and children and um, and just questions of transmission and tradition. And so I would love to hear your thoughts around how do you write a Jewish mother or how do you grapple with that kind of, you know, I always think of the the scene from one of Woody Allen's things of like the Jewish mother who's in the sky. <laughs> like, that is sometimes what it feels like. It's like right. there is that figure there, whether it's your mother or whether it's just Woody Allen's mother, there is that kind of hovering thing. Um, so I think, I, so I'll speak to this. So I have, I have Rose who is um, a Jewish mother. She has, uh, she's, she's had five children and she's actually pregnant again. Um, and then there's also Dottie, her daughter, who is also pregnant. I promise it works. Um, and so she's sort of a, a Jewish mother in training. But I really focused on Rose. And one of the things is I don't, I don't, I didn't go into it thinking like, oh my gosh, she's a Jewish mother. Like it wasn't this conscious thing I put in there. Um, and yet, a lot of the characteristics she has are ones that you would think of as maybe stereotypical. You know, she wants her children to be striving for better, for striving for more. Um, you know, she's very concerned about making sure everybody is a job and is in school and is well fed. Uh, but one of the things that's really important to me is that she was a, a whole person, that it wasn't just this Jewish mother, right? She's um, very political. You know, she's, she's a passion for it. She, she did that in the old world. And she really, one of the reasons she's upset about being pregnant again is she was looking forward to getting back to that. Um, and so it's very interesting because I definitely wanted to make sure. You know, we, I think that one of the issues when you're writing about Jewish characters in general is not wanting to slip into to stereotypes at all. Um, and I actually did one person, so Rose saves up money to send her daughter to college. She really wants her daughter to go to college. And, and one person actually wrote, like, oh, so surprised about the stereotypical 
Jews and money thing, and I was shocked. I was like, no, that's that's mm. not it at all. But it's definitely something I try not to be conscious of, but really try to also steer clear of at the same time, which is a really hard thing to do. Um, but so when I created Rose, like, and, and for Dottie too, Dottie's very, very passionate about her work. She wants to have kids, she wants to have a Jewish home, she wants the trappings, but she really wants to keep her job as head bookkeeper. Um, and so that that was important to give them this well-rounded aspect. Is that what you were going to read from? Yeah. Do you want me to just dive into that? Yeah. So yeah. the... Yeah. <laughs> I'll just dive right in. <laughs> so um, the scene I'm going to read is um, Dottie... Dottie, the daughter, knows that she's pregnant, and Rose, the mother, knows that Rose is pregnant, but they don't know about each other. Um, and so Rose is calling Dottie in after dinner to, to have a talk. Um, and this is, uh, I wanted to give this scene because it does show that Rose is more than just the eat a little more, you're looking, you're looking a little pale, go to school, study. So this is from Rose's point of view. Dottie followed me to my bedroom. Why is your leg bothering you so much, she asked. Old age, I said, though I was having my doubts. You should never know the problems my leg has had, but here it is fine. Dottie groaned behind me. I know, Ma. Dottie, who knew everything. What do you know, I asked. You've told me the story a thousand times. As if she ever listened to my stories. She thought she knew my story, but what did Dottie know? Could she have imagined me as I was, so young, so idealistic? I'm sure when Dottie pictured me, it was about Bushka and hunched shoulders, only standing my ground because I was too frightened to move. But truly, I had stood tall and proud, my back straight. I should have been frightened. My father had warned me not to protest, wanted to whip me when he learned how I disobeyed him. But I marched into the town square, defiant against the Tsar's decrees. I had dressed in my finest. My coat, mended by my own hand, appeared seamless. No one would have known how many times it had been ripped or nearly to death by my older sisters who owned it before me. I was fierce and beautiful as I yelled Menshevik slogans in my near-perfect Russian. I locked eyes with the soldier who sat regally upon a rich chestnut steed. He appraised me as I appraised him, and while his uniform sported many buttons, I saw the cloth was frayed and even bare in spots. His eyes moved from mine and slowly trailed down to my body in a way that made me involuntarily pull my coat tighter. His horse whinnied, drawing his attention back to my face. His horse began the march, and as he progressed with the phalanx of the Tsar's army surrounding him, I saw his eyes flicker, but I couldn't read what it meant, or they felt a burst of anger, of lust, of pity. And as his force moved move forward, I realized that what takes just a moment in time can be stitched into an entire story that lasts a lifetime, can be tattooed and never forgotten. That one moment would stay with me across continents and oceans, through marriage and deaths, against the distance of decades. And that one moment is as real and current as the feel of my sweat on an August day, or my son's hand tugging on the bottom of my dress, or a kiss from Ben under cover of the dark on a Shabbos night. I didn't feel the horse itself. I wasn't aware of the power of his legs, the heaviness of his load. I didn't hear the whinnies or see the look on the soldier's face at that moment. All I felt was the breath escaping my chest, the feeling of flight as I slipped through the air, the hardness of the packed dirt as my body slammed into it, the thundering of hooves filling my ears. The next month, my father put me on a ship to America. What did Dottie know? She knew nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I know. It's so funny because one of the um, one of the in one of the reviews in this book, um, the the reviewer said astutely, she called it like something like I'm obsessed with mothering and mothers, and I was like, oh, I guess I am. <laughs> and again, it was sort of me, sort of like realizing, and you know, I I did edit this anthology like you mentioned of birth stories by women writers, and um, and yeah, so it it continues, and there are many different sort of. I, I didn't kind of set it up again to be representative of anything, but I do have sort of like the the Emma, the Irish Catholic mother in the book has nine children. She didn't want to have as many children as she has. B abandoned this baby. Um, 
another woman, Susanna Story, is unable to have children. So it is. It does seem to be something I keep returning to. So, but the the so one of the things that I was really interested in, um, and I think this comes back to sort of what we're talking about about fiction allowing you to kind of see something very different from what people project. Um, the, probably the, the most fun I had writing any of these characters was Lillian, who is um, my character B's mother. And um, we generally, I, I've never consciously before sort of based a character on anybody real. It happens, of course, again, you recognize the pieces of them, but she was sort of very much, I was conscious that I was sort of writing what I knew, of, or at least like my ideas about my maternal grandmother. Um, Mildred, who my mother's actually from Charleston, South Carolina, and, and she was um, so. But I had, and I was three when she died, so I didn't know her very well. But I but I have been told all these myths about her um, and stories about her, and so and and she was an awful, awful mother um, <laughs> to my mother, and and I think that I didn't when I set out to write her, I didn't quite realize that part of what I was trying to do is figure out, you know, well, why and but what was going on in her and. And what were her what were her fears and what was you know so anyway um, Lillian came to be and and this is just this one I'll read this quick scene where she's um, you also get to see some of the wasp envy in this scene um, that I was talking about so um, yeah and I think all, yeah her daughter as you'll see is mentioned as B is the one in the fur who who abandons this baby but this is all ten years later this is in 1927 um, on Saturday mornings Lillian Haven. Oh, they've changed their name to Haven from Heschel. Um, one of the brothers changes it to Haven and one to Hirsch. It's all, you know, it's all about. Okay, so on Saturday mornings, Lillian Haven played bridge at the Draper House on Commonwealth Avenue with the College Club. She went to be among the Protestant women, to maintain her place among them, however tenuous it might be, to let their sense, understated, their voices, soft, their movements, slight, their entire atmosphere seep in and inflect her, she went for the chamber music, too, especially the violin, and for the sandwiches. Tiny triangles of cucumber or cream cheese or shrimp pressed between bread so impossibly white and airy, she felt transformed, almost, just holding one. Pinky out, mouth closed, she bit her tongue so as not to salivate. She could have done without the bridge or any other game. Games worked against Lillian because she always wanted too badly to win and was never able to hide this. And so the other women <laughs> and so the other women trusted her, the sole Jew, even less than they would have. Lillian's husband told her she was like a boot, laced too tightly. A foot didn't have a chance in or out. He told her if her parents had had the money to send her, send her to Miss Windsor's or the English to get her a scholarship, then she wouldn't have such a great need for friendship anyway. But Lillian hadn't gone to Miss Windsor's or anywhere else. She'd pinned hems for her mother, kneeling at the feet of men and women who weren't much better off than her parents, all of them shtetl folk in one way or another, all trying to pretend that Boston didn't terrify them. Even then, Lillian was disdainful of the cheap, prickly fabrics. She'd been 11 when her family came from Bialystok, had survived an eight-year desert of pinning and pubescence until Henry found her standing outside Elizabeth Pym's school for secretaries, her knuckles white from gripping the gate. He said he'd seen her beauty right away. She would never succeed in seeing it herself. And she had seen a sturdy, sunny, whistling, blue-eyed Jew in a finely tailored suit intent on saving her. The violinist was rotten this morning, sad when the score called for plaintive. There was a difference, Lillian knew, whiny as a fiddle on the high notes. They were playing Beethoven's piano trio in C minor, opus one, number three, a piece Lillian's daughter, Beatrice, had paid, played impeccably at age 14, and not just in the technical sense. Beatrice had a feel for music. Not quite virtuosic, they never called her that, which Lillian had thought for the best, believing that those sorts of girls scared off the good men. But gifted, certainly, that's what the teachers at the conservatory said. Beatrice had heard music, understood it, made it bloom under her fingertips as naturally as if it were her real language, before English, before the scraps of Yiddish she had picked up from Lillian's parents, despite Lillian's best efforts to make them speak English in the girls' company. Music was simpler, without accent or markings, nothing to be mispronounced or misunderstood because you were one sort of person and not another. That was its beauty, Lillian thought, the way a player, playing it, was both heard and obscured. 
This was freedom, it seemed to Lillian. This is what she heard when she listened to Beatrice play. Her daughter was free. So, um, yeah, kind of playing with, I, I also didn't kind of set out sort of like I'm going to represent a Jewish mother, and she's certainly not, I think in certain ways doesn't, you know, like she wouldn't care if Beatrice never ate probably, but, um, <laughs> but she, um, she has, it's sort of just playing with sort of trying to figure out what makes people tick and what, um, making her human. I feel like fiction so much comes from the inside out, you know, yes. starts the inside and moves outwards. So I feel yeah. like, you know, all of my books have Jewish mothers, but I, I don't ever think of them as being Jewish mothers like that, you know, in all caps. I, I feel like they're, they're the people, they're these characters and their mothers <coughs> and their daughters and their wives or their not wives or, you know, this whole combination. But I think it's that when you, when they become real, when they become separate from sort of who they're supposed to be or what world they sort of imagine them to fit into, like checking off the category boxes, but when they... There's always that moment with a character when you feel like, oh, I, I have you now. You know, yeah. I, I know you. Yeah, yeah. At first, it was like the pursuit of them. Like I'm you know, yeah. on their tail, or they're coming into like a Polaroid picture coming into focus, or that sense when, when you know them, when you've created them. And I think you know, that is when you, it's easier to move away from the sense of stereotype, yeah. when you feel like you're, when they become real people. I remember with my second book, The Outside World, one of the early reviews started off with, you know, Mervis makes gefilte fish out of stereotypes of Orthodox Jews. Mm -hmm. and I was like, I think that's a good thing, right? Like, it was a review, and it was like, huh, how's that interesting metaphor? Right, I'm like, right, I'm like, the metaphor itself we could discuss about whether that's stereotypes or right, right. that. But that, that sense of, you know, what does it mean to not look at people by their labels or their categories, but to just to go into them, that feeling of who are they and how do they fit their world, how do they not fit them? And I think with mothers, it's hard because we all are so familiar with that, that you know, that sort of overarching image, but I think once you start writing, like once you're inside the work, they become them, they become yeah. people, and, you know, I guess afterwards there's that question of, oh, this, you know, what are the stereotypes and how do they fit or not fit, but I think it's that, that sense of creating something that feels real, like true and real, and that, I think, is when it's easier to sort of move away from the idea of, you know, how they match up to these, right. or don't match, or just refute, I feel like I don't want to refute stereotypes, I don't want to confirm them, I just, I want to make individuals separate yeah. from that. It's like you, you, it's, what, it's when you know them and also when they surprise you. Right, it's exactly. Nice. Like, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I want to give a chance to uh, our audience members here to be part of the conversation. Yeah. Um, anybody can answer this. I, I'm very curious how you knew when you wanted to write. Get school. If you leave school on one on the side, but how inside of you, you just felt that that this is what you wanted to do, and what and what propelled you into those feelings as well. Uh, you know, for me, I mean, I started writing very very young. I think because I mentioned I moved, and I never sort of really felt like I belonged places, and it was like my little escape. Um, you know, I would make up these little worlds that I, I just lived in, and. Um, it's, um, there's something to me very escapist about writing. I mean, it, there are days when I have to force myself into that chair and it is miserable. I'm like, why am I doing this? But a lot of days it's just like, I can ignore the outside world. <laughs> a lot of times I've been needing that lately. Um, and just disappearing. Yeah. Maybe it's like a making sense of feeling. I mean, I, always want, I was always a reader. I was always one of those kids buried in a book. And that, I feel like that was sort of the first stage of wanting to be a writer. And, I was interested in journalism, but I, I feel like I can pinpoint the real moment when I understood the power of fiction. And I was a junior in college, and there was like a big family drama in my family. Ugly, messy, like, you know, this surface image of this like large, extended, happy family. And then there was, you know, was a, I'll save this for another novel, an ugly accusation made. Let's leave it at that for now. And, and it was shocking to me and deeply painful and scary. And it felt like this sense of a world being turned upside down. And, and, and the only thing I knew to do with it was to write. And I, you know, immediately I was going to, I started writing a novel. And because it was the sense of, I don't know how to understand this. I don't know how to understand a world that you think is one way and is in fact not that way, or is maybe not that way. And I wrote, I mean, when I look back at these pages, in some ways they're the rawest thing I've written. Um, they're completely unformed. There's no scene or dialogue. There's just like, <laughs> you know, just like writing. But it was that sense that, only, and it was going to be fiction. I wasn't even going to take the exact story, but that was the only way 
to understand a world around me. And the only way to make sense of it was to know. Yeah. yeah, I think that's sort of where I came to it as well. And along with that, a sort of um, sense of learning how to think. I mean, or not, no, it wasn't like my purpose, but, but in, you know, and I think my earliest journey, you know, writing like a lot of people's was sort of like just journaling, like writing about my life. And, you know, I found all these old notebooks and, you know, it's making sense of what, making mm -hmm. sense of my life and then also finding out what I thought and felt and then kind of questioning that. And, you know, that, and that process, which I think is really what, you know, what creativity is about too, is sort of the process of like, okay, well, what about this? But why that? And what's the problem? You know, kind of, a, you know, and then I think in the end, like what I, what does drive me, what I still, what I love so much, the moments, and there are moments where, that are just like, why am I doing this, this is terrible, it's so hard. <laughs> but the moments that are like, yeah, are moments where like the conversation with myself feels really fruitful and leads me to something that feels like, it does sort of make sense, um, not logically necessarily, but um, feels like a revelation in some way. Yeah, so like the hunger for that. There's like a loss of control a lot. I mean, for me, and I, I think of that like more of escapism, right? Because it's like you're writing, so you have control of what's going to go on the page, but you don't because you've created these characters who now have their own thoughts and actions, um, and you can sort of lose control of that. And I think sometimes in that, you can really see new things and, and learn new things about them. I think also learning about people in a new way. I, mean, I grew up with such a strong sense that there's like a surface reality and you know, I, you know, I feel like as a little kid you could intuit there's some more complicated story going right. on here. Like no one seems to name it, but you know, yeah. am I the only one who thinks this is bizarre? Or right. am I the only one who feels this? But to become a writer is to, to make that real on the page where all of a sudden you can give voice to, you know, I wonder what she's thinking. And right. it's like, well, let me write that. Let, let, me, let me explore that. Let me, let me open up that idea that the world is more complicated than, than we sometimes are willing to admit, or some people are willing to admit in certain places. And I think that is yeah. so much a part of it when you, you, know, you get to open it up in that way. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, I, so I understand the question of, to me, being a, saying I'm a writer takes a huge amount of confidence. Like entering into the world and saying, no, knowing you're a writer, yes. But then saying, I can go out there and dedicate, you know, weeks and months and years to writing a novel. Where does that freedom come from? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, I had been um, writing short stories for years before I, um, applied to graduate school and during that time I was working as a journalist and then I was like writing the short stories on the side and taking some workshops here and there and I think like the scariest part to me I remember about applying to graduate school in fiction for an MFA in fiction writing was that then I had to admit and make public that I wanted to write and it felt so terrifying like I, you know to the to people around me and, because then, then I could fail, right? It was like, it was like, well, if I say what I that I want this, like that was that was a that was really scary to me. And I think that it there wasn't any moment where I was like, all right, I have the. Con it was sort of like, it just became what I did. And then at a, in you know certainly at first you know like when my first story was, when I had my first story published, that was a moment of like someone else actually like thinks I can do this. I mean, there's I think other people play a huge role in helping support and give one confidence and like you know that's so important to have community in that way but I do think it's just it almost evolves less to be and I never set out like I'm go I want to be a writer I think I just kept writing and then it's like oh I'm I write <laughs> you know and now it turns out I'm a writer but it's um for me it wasn't sort of this like moment where I came out with a bold declaration I don't know that I was capable of that until I actually had done it if that makes sense I don't know. Like you always have to keep doing it. Oh, you have to keep sense. doing it all the time. Be like, like, yeah, no, you really are. Right. Like that yeah. constant, right, so that constant <laughs> reminding yourself. I think, um, you know, like the question of confidence, like sometimes it's just even when you don't feel it. Um, you know, I, I think maybe the beauty of being 22 is I was like, I want to be a writer. Like, well, that'd be fun. <laughs> and, you know, this it was a wish and a hope. And, you know, the Ladies Auxiliary was my first published anything. I ghost wrote columns for Governor Cuomo that were like in local New York town <laughs> papers. And that was the only, you know, they weren't even under my byline, but that sense, there's a shock also of like, I can't believe I've written this book and people are going to read it. And that feeling of, 
you know, but even then, there's, I think you still have to come back at that question of what does it mean to be a writer and how do I um, push myself further? And I think for me with Visible City, because it took 10 years to write, I mean, it was sort of a meltdown of that question of am I still a writer? Mm -hmm. I feel like, was it that I had been a writer and that I was going to be unable to finish this book and this, you know, I feel like I was in a death match of Visible City and it was going to be one of, you know, one of us were going to survive. <laughs> the sense that I felt like I lost that sense that I could finish this book. I lost the ability to, to write it. And I think, I think with any kind of art form, anything we want to do, that's a risk. You know, it's coming back at it, saying, I am afraid. I'm very afraid, and I'm going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. And it's that, you know, constantly facing it down. I don't think there's ever a moment as a writer when you, you know, I have confident moments, mm -hmm. you know, and certainly had moments of like, oh, good Lord, is this good? Is this all? You know, that churning, I think that is so much part of any creative process, any risk-taking. I think it's just always there with you.